Welcome to the podcast series, Talking Success, connecting the global fintech community. I'm Catherine Brassel, and today I'm joined by co-founder and CEO, Jeremy Takel at Pennyworth. Pennyworth Financial is a UK planning app that helps you reach your goals. They are remaking banking for the 21st century, really to help people turn goals into financial actions. Hi, Jeremy. Thank you so much for joining us today on the podcast series, Talking Success. How may I ask, has your week been so far? Oh, it's been very nice. Thank you very much. It's getting cold here in London, and uh, but the weather's uh, at least clear. Brilliant. No, I'm sure you can expect some some cold weather here in here in Cape Town. It's a beautiful day, <laughs> but um, I'm sure it is. Yeah. So we'd love to we'd love to kind of get uh, get started with the podcast with you and sort of ask you a little bit about um, sort of your career journey and uh, if you could sort of walk us through um, you know sort of around your sort of building banks and and really how you came to found Pennyworth Financial. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I spent most of my career to date at Barclays, um, uh, Barclays Bank, um, and joined as a graduate uh, after a short stint in the military. Um, And that's a slightly unusual corporate career in that, uh, as you said, I spent most of that time building banks rather Mm. than running banks, so building banks around the world. Um, And uh, uh, that involved uh, setting up banks in the periphery of the business. So I set up a credit card bank out in Scandinavia and a re- retail commercial bank out in Asia, uh, various similar franchises across uh, Middle East, Africa, and Europe. Uh, prior to that, I'd, I'd, I'd started my career in banking M&A, and I'd been involved in buying and selling parts of the bank Barclays franchise, including um, mm-hmm. leading a transaction to, 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 uh, to buy APSA Bank in uh, South Africa. Uh, and so uh, what, what became uh, um, um, some unique experiences it essentially became the theme of a career, which was actually uh, going to new markets and setting up new franchises and expanding the Barclays business uh, internationally. And what we found is that, the, uh, is that as, a, as a team, and I typically would do this with a, with a similar group of people, is that it became increasingly difficult to do that inside of Barclays. Uh, most recently, uh, in between 2016 and 2019, we'd set up a digital consumer bank for Barclays in the US mm-hmm. uh, and successfully grew it and uh, it was profitable uh, quite quickly as a business. Um, but it was increasingly difficult to do that inside a large siloed organization. And so uh, uh, decided to leave in 2019 to set up something smaller. And I, you know, I spent a bit of time uh, looking around, particularly the UK market of what was going on with Neo banks and challenger banks and incumbent banks. Uh, spent a bit of time working with a couple of uh, fintechs like Klarna, helping them with their banking strategy. Um, and then we decided to set up uh, Pennyworth, which is our, mm-hmm. uh, uh, our startup bank, so a bank for busy people, as we call it, i.e., uh, for the UK's first bank for the aspiring affluent. Who have been your sort of main target markets uh, with sort of the banking products that Pennyworth have brought out? And really, how have you been able to service this group? Yeah, I mean, we're, we're focused on, uh, as I said, the, the aspiring affluent, what's otherwise perhaps known as mass affluent. Uh, we've, we very much target a group that, um, uh, where they have uh, liquid savings or incomes of £40,000 or more, but up to about £150,000. So they're, they're, they're not rich enough to get private banking and wealth management. They are essentially mm. at the upper end of retail customers. And, and interesting, yeah. this is a market that, we've, that we know well. It's a market that typically, if we were entering uh, new jurisdictions with Barclays, would typically focus on because it's, it's often the soft underbelly of the retail banks in every market because it's the, mm. it's, it's the most complex and uh, um, higher end of the retail market, but because they're just retail and not um, wealthy enough for private banking, they get the same services as every other mass market customer, mm. yet they generate most of the revenue. There's a sort of 80-20 rule there. So this is, if, yeah. you think, if you think of it, this is young professionals through to middle managers and other busy people who are looking to get more out of their money. In the UK, it's about 10 million customers, but because they're also not getting uh, that sort of uh, financial advice, they suffer a huge uh, uh, lack of advice, an advice gap, as we call it. And um, it's, it's, a, it's, a, um, it's not a bank sector that has been 
are targeted much by new entrants, right? So this is there. There are increasingly uh, many neo banks in the marketplace, particularly in the UK, but they're typically targeting younger, uh, lower income uh, customers, and often targeting them with uh, just payment products. Uh, so that first wave of neo banks haven't quite addressed this market. So they're typic- This market typically are are uh, sitting with the incumbent banks. That's where they, you know they've is a uh, uh, large number of balances, both savings and loans. These guys borrow as well as, as as save, obviously, because they're trying to get on with their life. Yeah, yeah. And um, and how have Pennyworth identified a better way to do financial planning for customers? Um, and really, how is Pennyworth changing what it means to be a bank? Yeah, I, I think in many ways, I think first and foremost, what we're very clear about is what banking's here to do. Um, banking's really there to um, help customers um, fund their life, right? Find, go about funding their life. And a lot of people are not very clear about how do they do that, or maybe they're too busy or unsure how to, how to make changes to their finances. Uh, um, and as I said, that's not an area that uh, the existing banks spend a lot of time on. They don't really provide these guys with financial planning. They don't provide them with very great value products. And the new neobanks that are coming to the market uh, really haven't tried to crack that that very well either. So we instead say what a bank really should try to do is help do the heavy financial uh, lifting, um, whereas customers should really focus on what they're trying to achieve. So we want them to focus on their goals, what they're trying to achieve, and what those changes are of, what, uh, of their goals through time. Meanwhile, we turn it into a financial plan. We can focus on the uh, the real financial gap. And here's, here's an important thing. We're focused on customers uh, that are looking for uh, better value. Uh, these are not customers that want to necessarily change their banking, which is one of the big problems, I, again, we see in the marketplace. Everyone's trying to win their current accounts, their checking accounts. We're trying to say, you know, we've got better ways for you to save and borrow and invest to achieve your goals. And we'll provide those great value products We'll do it really easily. We'll do it very tailored. But all you really have to focus on as a customer is what the goals are you're trying to achieve. And we'll do the complicated thing of turning that into a financial plan and lining that up to the best products uh, in order to achieve it. And that's a slightly different way of going at financial planning. Typically, you'll be asked to lay out your finances um, and uh, you know, uh, set out uh, what your trajectory is, and only then start thinking about well, what are you trying to what are you trying to achieve with your goals? We want people to really focus on what are the goals they're trying to reach, and we'll figure out the plan to get you there. No, that's fantastic, and I mean, you're obviously you know coming from big incumbent banks, um, big established banks. I would imagine you know there have been quite a number of challenges particularly on the sort of funding so sort of the financial challenges uh you know being in a sort of startup space uh you know what sort of advice can you offer listeners around this that you've kind of tackled you know over this journey uh in the startup yeah it's a really good question and of course it's it's slightly based on the fact that our uh experience um has meant that we've been in the situation where we've started businesses from scratch many times before, but as mm. you highlighted there, uh, it's typically the uh, finance, financing of those businesses uh, that is new for someone like us, where previously we would have been backed by, uh, you know, big, uh, you know, corporate shareholders. Uh, so what that's meant for us is a couple of things. One, uh, we've you know we've had to bootstrap our way to a lot to a lot of this so uh, so my co-founder and I and a lot of the team working in the background in stealth have had to back themselves during this period of setting up the business and getting the uh, the, the, the startup underway and then we've had to use our network to really figure out okay so where are the uh, uh, routes to funding and those are very new markets for us as well. I mean, I was very familiar with the private equity market, but the venture capital market uh, and the uh, uh, the angel investor market are discrete uh, and and um, you know, separate pools of uh, uh, finance that you have to go and be introduced to. And so it's using your network mm. to get introductions to them, or using various uh, uh, platforms and and, and uh, advisors to help you get there. Yeah, so it's all about networking. <laughs> It's a lot about networking. It's a lot also about being prepared as you go into this to say, hey, I may be sitting here for you know uh, a year, two years, 
having to fund myself and the team having to fund ourselves, are we prepared for that? Uh, can we reduce yeah. our costs? Can we, can we build up the savings to make this work? Greater risk, greater return, what they always say. <laughs> right. And just tell me, in terms of, um, you know, the journey over the sort of the last year and a half uh, with Pennyworth, what have been sort of some of the high, the high points for you and the team? And what can we kind of expect to see over the next sort of six to 12 months? Yeah, it's been a, it's been a, real, it's been a real ride. Uh, we've just finished um, a real important milestone, which is uh, uh, we've completed our, what's called a pre-application process uh, for a bank license here in the UK. And that's a great um, uh, process that, that has been set up essentially for startup banks uh, by the UK regulator, by the, the, the PRA and FCA at the Bank of England. And uh, essentially, it's a way for you to then uh, submit your draft applications and have them reviewed and challenged to make sure they are fit for purpose. And we got through that in about 12 months. Um, to, you know, that took perhaps longer than we, we thought. Uh, but it's still uh, we, relatively fast, and again, we've done this on our own, on our own dime. So it's sort of uh, it's quite an achievement to to get through that. And what that does is, you know, providing we do what we said we are going to do in that application, it's, it gives you assurance that that you're uh, ready to go and you're uh, ready to uh, to, uh, to go to authorization as the next phase. What we've also done at the same time is uh, has released our first goals planning app. And uh, we launched our beta in the beginning of the year. Uh, we uh, had a successful beta testing phase uh, with around 400 uh, users testing, testing the app. And now we've launched that app into uh, you know, the, uh, the App Store and Google Play. As in, so it's in production and ready to grow. That's very exciting. Yeah. And, so, and, and then you know, with that, of course, uh, during this period, we've obviously tried to build up a, a set of followers. And we've got a sort of couple of thousand followers. And, Gradually, more to get, getting more downloads. Now that's where we got to, and where we're going is, um, you know, we're 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 now at a point where we've reached those milestones. We're going to try to bring in some third party money, so we're doing our first fundraising. We're raising a seed with some angel investors, uh, so we're out talking to angel investors as we speak. Um, uh, that will then lead us to uh, submit our final application and get authorized. And meanwhile, uh, you know, this is what we're mainly raising for is to then develop the app, add more features to it and really grow users. No, that's very exciting. And um, I mean, we will put all the information at the bottom of this podcast where people can go to download the app as well uh, and start to familiarize yourself with, with all of the exciting sort of goal setting platforms. Um, just circling back to you mentioned the second wave of Neo Banks earlier what have you identified as some key trends that we can look out for over the, the coming year? Yeah, I think it's really important to, to see the, the difference, I think, of the next wave of neobanks. I think there's been a great deal that's been achieved by the first wave. Uh, typically, mm -hmm. they've been in payments. Typically, they've been targeting younger uh, customers. But they've often had a sustainability problem, a monetization or a profitability problem, call it that. And so what I think you're going to see in the next wave is more sustainable business models. And I, what I mean by that is perhaps getting to the core of what, what banks and financial institutions really are. They're there to, to create credit or to create uh, uh, you know, risk transformation in the, in the market. And that's whether, you know, for banks, that's turning deposits into loans. Uh, mm -hmm. For insurance companies, that's taking you know, risk protection or premiums and turning it into long-term investments. That activity is what banks and insurance companies, other financial institutions make their money on. And very few fintechs are doing that sort of core balance sheet business. But to sustain to be to be sustainable, I think they're going to they're going to have to do that. Not only just delivering better UX, which has you know been critically important, it's really changed the game. Um, but at using the lower cost of the way you can build banks today to deliver much better value for customers. And so I think what you're going to see more of are fintechs with a financial balance sheet, which means fintechs that are not only profitable, but sustainably more, more profitable and better value than the incumbent businesses. No, that's very exciting. And I mean, what would be sort of some of your top sort of tips or knowledge that you can give some of our listeners, a lot of which are obviously in the startup space, like yourself, uh, and coming from the fintech, especially? Yeah, just some advice for some of our listeners today. What starting a business requires is you know, tenacity and commitment. Um, as I said earlier, uh, being prepared to um, fund your fund your own way to start off with. Actually, the the later you 
are you, know, you need to bring in third party investors who will start to constrain um, both your ability to to try new things and and uh, uh, go in different directions to some degree because they'll want to see more surety of of execution and business model. Um, so that so you know being prepared to be able to do that yourself, I think. Really understanding the business you're in, and 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 uh, you know, uh, there's a lot of experimentation going on in there. And the first wave of neobanks, I think, in a way, were an example of a lot of new people coming into the industry says this surely can be done better, but often lacked a, a little bit of understanding about what what what's sustainably driving this business. Why is it? Why does it exist? As, as and and focusing really just on the peripheral things around payments and 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 uh, and current accounts and so forth, which actually is not where money's made in banking at all. And so really knowing your business doesn't mean you, you, it's only for people like me who have come out of industry, but it just does mean at least you go and spend some time figuring out what is it about uh, uh, the business model that's, that's, that, that not only is not working and where I can add, you know, make an improved product, but actually um, you know, what's, what's still the fundamentals of this business and how can it be sustainable. So I think that's the that, two sides to that, which is one is, one is more on the the way you go about building your business, and the other is being prepared. And you know, we actually have a uh, inside the Pennyworth app. We have a goal on this, which is you know, a lot of people thinking about starting their own business. Um, and we have a we have a checklist in there of things you should be thinking about. Why should your business exist? What is your what's what's, what's going to be different about it? Have you thought through and prepared yourself for a period of of working hard on this without much return in, in, initially? Um, and those are pretty. I still think very solid. Uh, guides and, and a good way to to go about starting to think about setting up a business. And that's amazing. And I mean, it is all about trying to sort of achieve those goals. And like you say, just get people more empowered in terms of what they want out of their bank. Yeah, I think really understanding what is it people want from their bank. And a lot of people use their bank for lots of different things. But what is it really that's driving value? And what I mean, and, and, you know, if I'm to answer that question to some degree, it is well, it's, it's about funding your life, right? It's about uh, in early early part of your life, it's typically about be able to borrow for those short term and longer term things that, you're, that you want to do. You want to travel and uh, get a car and buy a house. And in the longer term, it's about um, you know saving for that uh, future income. Both of those roles are critical for, uh, um, for you, for anybody in their life. And that's what banks are there to help do. I would imagine as well, um, you would you would also be getting involved potentially in you know sort of planning for the future in terms of pensions and that sort of side as well eventually. We don't distinguish between what is typically uh, distinguishable in the industry between banking and wealth management. We're just thinking about customers' lives, so we're thinking about very near term goals that customers might have around uh, having a family or going to university or uh, you know buying the next car or whatever through to retirement and pensions and longer term aims that you're trying to get to. And, and that's because we're really helping people with their financial life. Uh, and the products that then go with that are then should just be incidental. So they are, whether it's uh, mortgages or, or consumer loans or uh, savings accounts or investments and pension uh, wrap, wrapped investments or pension funds um, are really just the solution to those problems. And we either will provide those uh, as Pennyworth or will curate uh, really great value products from third parties to help people through with that. So we see that as a, uh, a big part of Pennyworth, where it's a business that's to cross those traditional uh, themes of banking and financial planning. Um, and we're, we're at one app in that covers both of those things. Yeah, I love what you, you said about funding your life, because that, that really does... Uh, ring true to a lot of what what people want to do with their banks, you know, in an ideal world <laughs> where they they matter more than just being a number. Um, and it's yeah, it's very exciting the product that you are offering, and it's going to be really exciting to see see it grow over the next year, and uh, and perhaps touch base, you know, in a year's time and see where you're at. <laughs> I'd love to do that. I'd love mm. to believe that we could fulfill that promise of, as mm. you said helping people fund their life. And for us, that's, that is the key differentiator now. It's, it's not only a question of having a really effortless experience. That, that, I think that's what the first wave of neobanks were able to demonstrate. But it's also about delivering great values, I've just said, because we can do it at so lesser cost. 
but also to make it tailored and personalized to people's real lives. And that's what goals-based planning does. No, that's fantastic. And uh, if our listeners, if anyone needs to get hold of you, would like to reach out to you, what is the best way for them to connect with you? Yes, that's a great question. I'm, I'm, on, I'm on LinkedIn, uh, Jeremy uh, uh, Takel at uh, LinkedIn. And uh, if you uh, mentioned that you heard me in the podcast, then I'm happy to connect. As well as uh, on uh, the website, there's a little bit of a backstory. That's uh, pennyworthfinancial.com. Uh, a little bit of a uh, intro to, to, to us as well as the business as well as then you can download the apps from there. Brilliant. Thanks so much, Jeremy. It was such a pleasure having you on the podcast with us today. Catherine, it was great to speak to you. Thanks very much. <laughs> Thank you for listening to this week's episode, Talking Success, connecting the global fintech community. Please follow us on LinkedIn under Talent in the Cloud, or if you're interested in exec talent, expanding your fintech team, or you yourself are looking for an exciting change in your career, please check out our website, talentinthecloud.io.